So I think we already talked about this in pretty great detail. So again, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is systolic heart failure, right? In systole, we have a reduced ejection fraction. And that decrease in contractility, that decrease in ejection fraction is causing there to be a lot of volume. Now, what are the classic causes of this? So, you know, the big three, I like to think of things in three. And the big three here are going to be ischemic heart disease. You know, part of this has to do with, you know, if you have an MI, for example, you can have a certain region of the heart that has regional wall motion abnormalities. It's not contracting the way that it should, usually in an older patient. And so that can lead to a decrease in your ejection fraction. Everything's not working the way that it should. We can't get the blood out the way that we want. That can certainly cause systolic heart failure. Viral myocarditis is another one that tends to come up on board questions. You know, if I'm thinking ischemic heart disease, for example, I'm thinking of an older patient, right? I'm going to think of somebody at least over 50, usually in a board question. And then viral myocarditis, this is going to tend to be in a younger patient in general. So if they're asking about systolic heart failure, you know, viral myocarditis, it's typically going to be a patient that has some kind of viral prodrome that leads to uh, eventually having systolic heart failure. And this has to do with the body, you know, trying to react to, you know, some of the direct cytotoxic effects from the virus, but then there's also an autoimmune component that leads to this damage to the heart causing systolic heart failure. And then the other last one on here is chronic alcohol use. Also, when you're thinking alcohol use, if they have a patient that has Wernicke's encephalopathy, right, for example, and, you know, those are patients that are very classic for systolic heart failure, but just be careful, okay? This is where I want you to be careful because if you have a patient that has alcohol use, right, now normally, so we're going to draw three arrows here. So most of the time, they're going to be giving you a, a systolic heart failure, right, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction occasionally, right? If you have a patient that has, you know, consuming too much alcohol, again, Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff syndrome, all that stuff, occasionally this will turn into a B1 deficiency patient, okay? And they're going to tell you something like when they give them vitamin B1, the transketolase level goes up, right? That's just an example. So if you, if they have a thiamine deficiency, right, that's very consistent with alcohol use. Remember, this can cause high output cardiac failure, okay? which is different than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or systolic heart failure, remember the cardiac output is going to be, tend to be low. The ejection fraction is going to tend to be low. In high output cardiac failure, initially at least, the patient is pumping out too much blood, right? The heart's working too hard and eventually it'll burn out, okay? But just keep that in mind. So again, just to go through this path of physiology one last time here. So decreased contractility, decreased ejection fraction, lower cardiac output, that's going to lead to a larger left ventricular and diastolic pressure. I'm not ejecting as much blood, so I have more pressure kind of left over in that ventricle. This, and this is particularly high yield, this is an eccentric hypertrophy. So, you know, it's important to know kind of what that means. So just imagine we kind of have a cross section here of the left ventricle. Okay, so let's say, you know, the left ventricle normally looks like that. Now, if I had an eccentric hypertrophy, what I'm talking about is there's going to be more sarcomeres added because that's the hypertrophy component, right? So I'm adding more sarcomeres. Now, I could add sarcomeres in two directions. I can add sarcomeres in this direction, almost think of this like a donut. I can I can make that a bigger donut with less ventricular cavity size. Or the other thing I can do is I can add sarcomeres this way. So in systolic heart failure, we're adding the sarcomeres in the latter way, right? So I'm adding them kind of longitudinally around here. I'm adding more sarcomeres. So what happens here is I'm actually going to get kind of a, a larger ventricular cavity size. Okay, but the problem is, is that you can see there's really a drop in my ability to contract. Okay, so my ability to contract in this ventricle, even though I have so much space in here, I can't really squeeze it out. I'm kind of just holding a bunch of fluid, but I can't squeeze it out because I don't have kind of a thick enough myocardium there to really generate a strong contraction. And this happens when we add these sarcomeres, these contractile proteins in series. Okay, so I'm adding them in series. So it's almost like I'm linking more of them together around this myocardium. And so that's essentially what's happening. So I'm just kind of linking them further around. I'm just making this bigger. This is what happens when we have volume overload. So volume overload, very classically, will come up with this eccentric hypertrophy, increasing contractile proteins added in series. That leads to an increased compliance, right? I, can I have more blood that I can accommodate in here, but guess what? I can't really eject it out. I have a really poor ejection fraction, really poor cardiac output. And that essentially is systolic heart failure.